Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Jim Baldwin. Hello, good evening. Um, great crowd. I'm glad to see you all come out tonight. Um, we've got a good, uh, nice evening planned to have Mr. Oderski uh, tell you all about Scala 2.1. Um, before we do that, I kind of wanted to give you an idea of why the hell Intel is hosting this event, because I'm sure everybody is wondering if we're trying to design chips with a new language or something like that. And it turns out we're not. I had really had to start digging in and figuring out if we're going to make an investment in new technologies for building a web service, what, what technologies should I use? And you, know, you start doing internet searches for um, different ways of building and different new technologies you've heard about. And it, it's, it's um, awe-inspiring to see what the level of choice there is out there. So we looked at um, all kinds of different ideas for how to, how to build our web services. I knew I wanted to do it in the cloud. I knew I wanted to get away from SQL as the only way of storing data. Um, I wanted it to be infinitely scalable from day one, from the first user to the 100 millionth user. I, I, I wanted to make sure that we were ready to grow and build a powerful service, because the last thing you want to do is find yourself redesigning everything as you grow and, and the system starts to creak around. Um, I wanted something where I could do rapid development. I didn't want to have uh, a lot of rules, a lot of, a lot of complex structures in the system, a lot of you know, IDL files that allowed me to tie um, different interfaces together. Um, so we, yeah, we looked at a lot of different things. We looked at the J2E stuff and Spring, and, and uh, it, it was interesting, but it seemed, seemed a little heavyweight. It felt like we were going to make a big, big investment in trying to understand an, in, an infrastructure instead of trying to understand the problem we're trying to, to solve. And um, looked a little bit at uh, um, some radical stuff like Python and Django, and I still think it's cute and, and, and lovely, but it didn't feel like it had the strength to scale, something we could really uh, stand on. And we spent some time um, looking also at like Node.js, Node which is, a, I, I think, a pretty promising option for people where you want to just focus on learning one language, but it's simply not ready yet. It, it, it doesn't seem to me something I could stand up um, an entire service on. So then I stumbled across um, uh, Scala a few months, really diving deep and trying to understand if this technology could take us where we wanted to go, and uh, fell in love with the fact that I could, I could have a functional language, which was a hell of a lot more concise and easy to write code in once you kind of get over that initial hump. Um, interoperability with the legacy Java stuff was uh, astonishing to me. I was able to pull in Java libraries from all kinds of different places into a Scala environment and not have to write any, any boilerplate code around it, just get called directly into all that stuff. So beautifully, beautifully implemented um, segue from the world of Java to the future world of uh, multiple languages. So um, we're, we're very happy to now, now we've grown our team from, I think in the, in the last six months, we've grown from about three to about 20 or 25 web services developers. A lot of them are, are here in and around you who are now all Scala geeks and, and happily um, uh, in, in, you know, setting up our services. We're using, we're, we're definitely diving into play. It's a beautiful framework, a hell of a lot more concise than anything I've ever seen before for trying to stand up REST services. Um, and uh, things are going well. We're very, very happy uh, with the choices we made. So we've, we kind of, we're so enthusiastic that we can't help but, you know, you know, get to know TypeSafe better, and we've been working very closely with them, and that's why we decided to host some of these meetups, because there's a really good chance for us to, uh, to get deeper into the technology that we're um, going to rely on for the service we're going to stand up. And uh, it's been, been a ton of fun for us. So, um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's why we're here. Um, very happy to be using this technology. I want to introduce um, uh, Martin before I finish here. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Martin Oderski is, uh, is a professor of, of programming methods at École Polytechnique uh, Fédérale de Lausanne uh, in Switzerland. Um, he is, of course, the designer of the Scala language and the, um, the creator of the current version of the Java compiler. Um, he is, his Coursera course recently offered in um, functional programming in Scala now has 45,000 people signed up for it, which is a lot of people for something like Scala. And I wonder if some of those people are real. 
<laughs> um, you know, I've got a Twitter account, and I'm sure they're not all real people. Um, his favorite whiskey is Lafroig, in case you're interested in giving him a gift. <laughs> his favorite wine is, Br is a Brunello, and uh, my favorite wine is a Barolo, just in case you wanted to know. Um, and uh, he's, he's here to tell you uh, about the latest developments in Scala. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Martin Odersky. Okay, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the uh, developments that uh, we have been brewing in Scala, what is going to come out uh, fairly soon, and also a little bit more long-term, like what is the philosophy behind Scala. Uh, it's a very wide tent. People interpret all sort of, sorts of things in it, so I wanted to essentially show some direction where I think it should go. Not, not that I matter uh, at all for that so too much anymore. <laughs> So what is the philosophy behind Scala? Where is it going? And what, to what degree did that shape the 2.10 release? What's in the 2.10 release? So um, I think uh, that's a slide I show in every talk I give. Uh, so if you've seen previous talks of mine, then please excuse the repetition. But I think I can't keep repeat it more enough that uh, Scala really is a unifier. Uh, it's a unifier between worlds that were quite different so far. So one is the uh, world of object-oriented programming, and the other is the world of functional programming. And uh, previously, these, these worlds have been completely different. And even nowadays, I think most people on both sides believe that uh, everything that the people on the other side do is uh, complete idiocy or a work of the devil or what, whatever. So I really had this impression from, from both sides. Uh, and uh, it doesn't go away that much. So we're still very much in the minority, but I really believe that uh, that's actually not, not true at all, that one uh, can actually and should take the best of both sides, and that it's a very fertile and, and interesting combination. Uh, when I say combination, I don't mean uh, let's just heap all the object-oriented constructs in our language and then all the functional and make one big um, melange uh, of, of these things. So not, but the, the trick is really to identify the key features and then unify them to say, well, uh, uh, the key features have an object-oriented side and a functional side, but it's the same feature. And I think that's where Scala went much, much further than any other language and what, what I believe the real heart and core of Scala is. So what Scala in particular is not, uh, it's not a Haskell that runs on the JVM. And it's also not a Java with some additional frills. Uh, it's neither one nor the other. It's really a completely different blend of functional and object-oriented that doesn't really try to be just essentially one side with, with, with some, some, some additions. Uh, what you also get from that, uh, maybe surprisingly, is a language that is uh, here in the vertical axis both uh, a language that can sort of stand in as a scripting language, uh, a fairly credible scripting language in the sense that a lot of the advantages that you get, a REPL, uh, light white syntax, types get out of the way, all of that, what, what you have used in dynamic scripting languages, you see in Scala as well. And at the same time, Scala is essentially just a drop-in replacement for, for Java, uh, can, can run mission-critical software, big systems, performance-critical systems, uh, uh, because, of course, in the end, it compiles to bytecodes that are very, very similar to the bytecodes the Java compiler compiles to. Okay, so what I want to... I already mentioned that I think the important bit here is what distinguishes Scala from, let's say, the pack of other Java plus X languages is really the functional aspect. Uh, there's one other uh, language that pushes very much the functional aspect on the JVM, and that's Clojure. And that's also a great language, but the two are slightly different in that Clojure is very much in the Lisp tradition. So it's a, it's a dynamically typed language, whereas Scala is a statically typed language, which has from the functional genes, it took them much more from languages such as ML or Haskell than, than from Lisp. But that said, I think both uh, uh, and also Clojure is really much more on the functional side and not really object-oriented, whereas Scala is the only one that has the fusion. But let's talk about the functional side. So I think it's quite phenomenal to see how 
uh, much function programming seems to be on the rise. And I think, think that phenomenon is only the last years. So five years ago, you saw nothing of that. Maybe some predictions by some weirdos. And now it's really in the air. And I mean, we have the data to prove it now. So one, I'm, I'm coming from academia. So uh, I saw in the conferences, I, I was one of the few guys who went to both Uppsala and ICFP, the functional programming conference, and uh, also ECOOP, that's the European conference on object-oriented programming. So 12 years ago, ECOOP had more than 500 attendees per year, which is big for a scientific conference. You can't compare to Java 1. Uh, Uppsala had about uh, 3,000, uh, and ICFP had maybe 150. So uh, ECOOP was three times ICFP, and that was the order of things, because of course, object-oriented programming was the standard and much more important than these fringe of academic lunatics that did functional programming. Uh, nowadays, ICFP is three times bigger than ECOOP and, uh, as, uh, the, in, in, in this year's attendance. And Uppsala actually stopped existing as an independent conference. It's now part of Splash, and uh, so it's just a track of a, uh, of a mantle conference that dropped the name object-oriented. The other thing uh, uh, was already mentioned that uh, over 45,000 people signed up for the Coursera course I started to give, and that's also quite quite phenomenal that you say, well, 45,000 people really with that interest uh, who find the time to actually get the videos, uh, do the assignments and things like that. It's a significant time investment. It's not something you just look at and, and, and spend half an hour and then you do something else. So that's, that's amazing. Industry adoption, of course, also, uh, uh, and we see that now. Initially, it was mostly for the like hot web properties like uh, Foursquare, Guild Cloud, LinkedIn, Living Social, The Guardian, Tumblr, Twitter, and so on. But I think we, we see it now more and more in big enterprises, traditional enterprises. One is Intel, as Juniper, Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Sears. They all essentially uh, have have significant the project with Scala. TomTom and Hopefully not responsible for the Mac, uh, for the uh, for the for the map disaster, uh, and so on. And of course, many banks and many hedge funds and things like that. But they are not surprising because they are always essentially out to get the latest technology. The surprising thing is elsewhere. It's the WalMarts and Sears and things like that. So five years ago, this would have been unheard of. Uh, you could ask, well, why now? Why has it happened now? Uh, when we came out with Scala, we, I, I sort of made a bet, and I made the wrong bet. I thought that maybe functional programming would be important because of XML. So that's why Scala has XML literals, to cater to that, uh, because XML was the classic example which you couldn't do very well object-oriented, because uh, you couldn't put the methods in the nodes. XML is pure data, they're not methods, so you had to look at the at the, at the nodes from the outside, and that's something where functional programming and pattern matching is very strong. So I thought, well, XML is it. Turned out to be maybe uh, just a footnote in history, maybe not. So now we have a thing which seems to be much, much more important in the end, and it took its time, and it's coming from hardware, as uh, a lot of trends. Uh, so uh, it's coming from hardware in particular because companies like Intel are not uh, uh, cranking up the clock speeds anymore. So uh, what we get is not uh, necessarily faster processes, but more of them. And then the question, of course, is what do we do with them? And it's not just what do we do with them, but it's also the uh, fact that we get more uh, uh, bigger and bigger workloads. And those workloads, even for a multi-core processor, they don't uh, uh, exceed those. So we go into the clouds, we go into data centers, and there we have yet another degree of parallelism. So we, in this new world, we have this triple challenge of how to make work a parallelism, so how to make use of parallel hardware to uh, make software, to make programs faster. Then we have the challenge of async, that we say, well, if we uh, are in this world of concurrency and, uh, and uh, event-driven systems, as almost all systems are today. How do we deal with such events? And finally, we have the problem with, of distributed computing, where we say, well, if you have delays and failures, how do, we, how do we deal with those? All three problems are very hard. And they have one thing in common, 
at least one thing in common. The one thing in common they have is that for each of them they're made harder the more mutable state you, are, you have. Mutable state is becoming more and more of a liability for each of these. You have problems like cache coherence, how do you keep caches coherent over the internet. You have races, uh, you have problems from, of versioning and so on. So the, the, the moral of all that is to say, well, the state is a Mutable state is a thing that has to be very, very carefully managed in this new world. So what you shouldn't do is just say, well, by default, everything is mutable and we just have assignments left and right. That's not something that is really end of life by now. I think from, from now on, you would say that the things that are cheap and uh, Unproblematic is uh, the purely functional way. You create new data out of old ones and you can use it wherever. As long as it's immutable, no problem. But every piece of state is something that you have to justify. I'm not saying you, you, you should do without it. Quite often you can't, but you have to justify it. And that's, I think, the, the, the main difference that we see here. So in a nutshell, to just show you the problem here, is the, the, that the the core of the problem is the non-determinism that's caused by concurrent threads that access the same shared mutable state. So in that little program here, you have two asynchronous computations and a shared variable. And one of them adds one to the variable and the other multiplies it by two. And depending how you run these things, uh, that's, a, I think, concurrency 101 that can give 0, 1, or 2. Uh, so, uh, it's a non-deterministic computation and of course non-determinism is bad because our whole software industry more and more is really built on the fact that things can be reproduced, that things are reproducible. Very hard to write good tests if you can't reproduce your things. Uh, very worrying if your, if your client has a problem and you can't reproduce it on your own, on your own installation. Even worse that if you have a problem and you, then you instrument your code to find out what happens and then the problem goes away because the timing uh, profile goes away. So there, there, there are fun things like that. So it seems that since we have by nature of, of our workloads and the nature of our hardware, parallel processing is inevitable. Uh, Non-determinism comes from parallel processing and mutable state. So to get back to deterministic or some degree of deterministic processing, we need to uh, eliminate or at least um, minimize the mutable state. And that means we need to program functionally. So one way to look at that, uh, a, a little bit uh, hand wavy, but uh, anyway, I think it gives a good impression is um, as the difference between thinking in space versus thinking in time. So if you program imperatively in the, in, the, in the classical way, then it's very much a matter of time steps. You say, I have to initialize this variable before I can use it. I have to grab this lock before I can enter the critical region and so on. It's very much in the order of things. Now, those of you who have already written functional code, uh, you'll probably realize that that Time doesn't matter in functional code. It doesn't matter. It, it just the, the only thing that matters is what do I construct from what other things. In what order that happens is irrelevant. In fact, there's a deep the theorem in functional programming that proves that it's irrelevant. That the it's the so-called church russell theorem of lambda calculus. So it proves that the time is irrelevant. And in, indeed, that's not just a, th a theorem. Uh, but it's, it's really a very deep mode of thinking functionally, that what you do since the times of APL, really, when people started to do that, was, was saying, well, I built that thing out of the other one, and then I built these things, then in, not in the temporal sense, but the more in, this, in the spatial sense, I would say. So if we add uh, parallel processing to that, in space, it's very easy. We can build things in, at any time, that means we can also build them in parallel uh, by different agents at, uh, at, at, at the same time. Whereas if we do imperative programming, then it gets very difficult uh, because you have all these different time strands that access the same variable, and then you get races and uh, deadlocks and uh, things like that. So <clears throat> the, the only way to guard against that is essentially to put in barriers that say, well, certain thing, bad things uh, that you have these knots in the timelines, they can't happen. And that's a thing that uh, is worrying because you never know whether you put in enough of these. 
barriers and locks and, and synchronized regions and monitors and whatnot. Or you put in too much and you lose out in parallelism or you risk a deadlock. There's no good way to do it. Uh, and uh, the, the bad thing about it is you have to sort of think of all the possible bad things, all the possible bad interleavings that could happen to determine where you need to put in your locks. And that's something that is not fun to do, at least I don't find it fun to do. <laughs> and I think we are generally very bad at that. Uh, that's not our mode of thinking. We want to think target oriented. I want to get there, not I want to, I need to prevent this thing here, and this thing here, and this thing here. So you could say, okay, so that was the case for functional programming. What about objects? Uh, should we just ditch them and say, okay, f away with objects? Uh, I, I believe that's actually not true because uh, I think what the industry learned about objects over the last 30 years, particularly in analysis and design, stays absolutely valid. And uh, the reason why it stays valid is because a lot of it addresses a central question, which is what goes where? How do I group things into entities that make sense? And why, by what, uh, how do these entities interact with each other? And that's something you have to answer for every big system. And that's, in, in fact, a little, I would say, white lie of some of the more radical functional languages to say, well, you don't need to do that. If you look under the covers of these languages, then you find that in some way or another, they all have a global namespace. So think, they think the same thing as universal monkey patching, to say, well, you just declare this and it's visible everywhere. A type class in Haskell is visible everywhere. A record field in OCaml is visible everywhere. And that's just with our systems, the systems we deal, deal with, that's just not scalable enough. I mean, we have systems that live for dozens of years, have millions of lines. Imagine you have a thing that's visible everywhere, and that's, that's a name that's taken for all future, for all programmers, how difficult that would be. So that's why I think that the, the concept of structuring of modularization, which is object-oriented, is essential. But I should be fair to say that's not all functional languages that are like that. There has been a language like ML, and uh, that actually takes this thing very seriously. But uh, the only language that doesn't have this global namespace leaking is really SML. And that's a language that's used fairly little in industry. It's, it's, it's a language that with, with not a very large user base. OK, so that's why objects. So, uh, but I think we need to have a new take on objects. So previously, when we talked about objects, I think the, one of the um, uh, most uh, often quoted and best, best known, one of the best known quotes was the, this one by Grady Booch, which says, an object is characterized by its state, identity, and behavior. And I think he got it wrong on two counts, two counts of three. So I think uh, state, uh, and with state, I mean, I think I, people mean mutable state. Uh, no, uh, rather not. Would be much better if you didn't have mutable state. And we have precedents for that. Java lang string, it's an immutable, it's an object, definitely, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't have mutable state. And this is good. This is, we want more of those. Uh, Identity, by which I think people typically mean reference equality. Again, no, that's probably the wrong way to think about object equality. I think you should rather have structural equality or user-defined equality. And behavior, yes, of course. So we want to concentrate on the functionality in these objects. You could say, well, as, are these things then still objects? It's a valid objection. So if they don't have state and they don't have identity, are they still objects? Um, for me, I believe the crucial thing is as long as I can talk about my own object with a this or a self, it's an object. So in that sense, yes, these things are objects. OK. Uh, there's one more uh, thing that uh, also is a very object-oriented notion, uh, tell, don't ask. Uh, that's a uh, very common advice. So wouldn't that run counter to the functional uh, paradigm? Yes, indeed, it would, because telling, if you tell somebody something, then uh, you would assume that something happens, and that would have to be a state change. So um, I believe that advice is actually due to the von Neumann bottleneck. That means the tendency to communicate with small primitive values. And uh, so that means that you have complex 
complicated state, but only a very small communication channel. So then tell is much better because you can say, well, just change your state and do that. Whereas if I want to find out what the state is, I have to sort of ask a lot of time and get lots of different uh, small values. Uh, with functional programming, that's different because we routinely pass complete object graphs of immense size back and forth is just a single reference. Everything is immutable. There's no cost to that. So now I think the, the analog of that would be instead of tell, don't ask, you say ask to construct. You'll construct something that can be quite complicated, but, uh, and then give me that. So more structured objects, more, 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 more graphs that, that, that get passed as information. OK, so that was the concurrency region, a uh, reason. But I think as when object-oriented programming started uh, 30 years ago, uh, I think there's more than that. Uh, uh, so when object-oriented programming started, for those of you old enough to remember, uh, it started because of GUIs, because you couldn't really program a graphical user interface without an object-oriented language. That was a hard reason. Then people sort of grudgingly adopted this new technology, and then they found out, oh, there's actually other advantages, modeling, reuse, and things like that. And of course, these were touted before, but the industry didn't move until it had to. It's always like that. I mean, the people are conservative. And I think for FP, it's the same thing. I think the great advantage of functional programming is it's much simpler, it's more productive, and it's just much more fun. But by themselves, these things are probably not strong enough to move a whole industry. Whereas the, the thing you have to say, you have to deal with concurrency, asynchronicity, distribution is a much more urgent and, and, and uh, compelling reason why you have to. So I think these are sort of the, the real, the meta reasons behind FP, which fortunately we, we, we also get uh, together with the concurrency argument. OK, so you might say, simple? Uh, Scala, simple? Uh, last, last time I heard, it's a super complicated language. And in fact, we have this uh, prejudice quite a, quite a bit. If you, if, you, uh, try, if you browse the internet, you will hear quite a lot of these opinions. Um, well, and that's uh, a matter of how you look at it or how you write Scala. I think Scala can be as simple or as complex as you like. You can do very complicated stuff at it, uh, as you can in the end with every language. But it's true that there are a lot of, not a lot, but quite a few Scala people who write amazingly uh, powerful and also complicated stuff with it. And it can be as simple as you like. Uh, I believe it's best when it's simple. So one example where Scala is simple is, is Kojo, the environment for kids that uh, essentially learn programming and mathematics with uh, essentially very, a very simple platform that's built on top of Scala and that uses essentially a, a, a Scala DSL and also full Scala to write these things. And there, there, there are hundreds of girls in an Indian school uh, that, uh, that use that as their primary environment. And now it's an internet movement also to do that. Or uh, I don't know whether you've uh, seen this one. That's uh, just a talk. Well, maybe I skipped that. So Shadai, uh, Shadai uh, Ladad, he has a YouTube channel where he has absolutely cool talks, uh, uh, and discovers lots of interesting problems, and explains to them in a, in a completely uh, overwhelming, sympathetic manner how, how, how he would solve those things. It's, it's really great. So um, rather than showing you the video, I, I just wanted to show you uh, that my, something let's uh, myself, or let's just do that. Uh, I see the fonts are small. So let's get the font size bigger. I was sort of thinking that the resolution would be worse on the screens than it is. So I'm, I'm surprised that. Uh... Okay. Okay. Can you read that? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to produce a new. Uh, Worksheet, which is uh, a new fancy thing we have in Scala. Um, call it um, Scala problems. 
OK, so here we have a Scala worksheet. And what we can do with that is we can do stuff like write uh, val xs equals uh, list of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. And what you see here is that, oops, what did I, yeah. Uh, wait. Oh, it's. Uh, I might have. I might suffer the demo effect here. <laughs> I might have created the same one already. Okay, let's let's try it. Let's try again. All right, so what I want to do is uh, OK, that's better. I think I just, so it's a beta feature. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll introduce that. Uh, we use it in the course, uh, but it's, it's very, very new. And uh, I think I just got one thing where, where it didn't work quite. OK, so what I want to do is I want to solve a problem. Uh, it's one of the 99 uh, Scala problems. Uh, we're going to do a couple of them. So the first one is very simple. I just want to find, um, define a, a function that says, is something a palindrome? OK, so let's do that. So we would have write def is palindrome. And it should work for all uh, types of lists. And the question is, what should it be? Uh, well, right now, I, I left that open, so the triple question mark says, I don't know yet. Uh, but we can already write a test case. Why not? So that should return false, right? OK, so what we get is we get a non, not implemented error that, uh, well, yes, of course, we haven't given you an implementation. So that's our current worksheet here. So let's give it an implementation. So one, when is something a palindrome? Well, if it reads the same way from both sides, so we would say xs equals xs.reverse, right? And there we go. So uh, now we. Uh, instead of the not implemented exception, I get false. Uh, so let's test this with something else. Let's make a, a is palindrome. Uh, let's pass it a string, and which is a palindrome in this case. OK, so now we get an error. What does it say? Uh, it says that uh, it found a string, but it needs a list here. It says it's twice, which is another bug of the worksheet. We're, we're going to fix that. Um, so right, so strings are not lists. Uh, so one way to fix this is just to convert that to a list. And then we get our is palindrome test that works for lists as well as strings. And it gives us the right result each time. So what you see here is this uh, idea of essentially immediate uh, feedback. You see everything in the. In the same, in the same uh, editing panel, you see the types, you see the values. And whenever you change something, everything gets recomputed automatically, which I think makes, makes it much, much easier to, to set something up. So you have the test cases, you have the definitions, you have everything in the same sheet. It's uh, great for explorative programming that where we just want to find out something quickly. And the good thing is that thing is actually not a REPL session, so it's, but you have a record of that. That's a file. You can save it, you can reload it, you can, you can, you can uh, uh, start it again. Let's do another one. Um, so the next one I want to do is um, uh, the uh, problem from 99 Scala Problems 9, which says pack consecutive duplicates of list elements into sublists. So it means something like that. We have a list where we get sub six. Uh, elements that are duplicates and follow each other, and they should be packed into sublists, like here. OK, so, a lot. so let's see how we would do that. OK, let's create some test case first. Let's say uh, 
what, what should our list be? A couple A's, couple B's, maybe two A's again. C, H, F, uh, S, T. Okay, something like that. And we want a list. Oops, that's of course not syntax. Let's call this data. Okay, and what we want to do now is essentially a uh, remove duplicates. Uh, so, no, sorry, a, a, a um, um, how do you call this? Uh, um, to create clusters. Um, you can say. Yeah, cluster. So that would take um, a list of T's, let's say, well, arbitrary T, so it would be a type parameter. And it would, should return a list of list of T's, right? And uh, we don't know what it is yet, and we would, would know that cluster of data. So to print that, yeah, of course, it's not implemented. So let's uh, work on the implementation of that. So how would we do that? Well, um, we probably have to ask here, is the list empty? Ah, well, before we do that, let's do a pattern match, of course, sorry. It says match, so that's sort of the, the standard way we would uh, deal with lists. Uh, so if it's uh, the empty list, then uh, there's nothing to return. Otherwise, uh, it's a list that, let's say, starts with an element Y and follows with YS. So what do we do then? So then we have to essentially split the list. We have to say, well, all elements that are like Y will become, will go into the first sublist and the rest we deal with later. So uh, there's a thing that we can use here. Uh, what function would that be? I think it's called span, but let's just try it out. So let's say it's data span, um, and the function would be, uh, oh, so we, we, so we want to say we want to, ah, I haven't done that yet. So whenever we have a mistake, we can put in triple question marks, we'll fix everything. And uh, let's see what our span gave us. Okay, so that gave us a list of four A's and then the rest of the list. That seems to do the right thing. So I, I did a quick thing and says, well, let's hack that. Okay, so I can remove that. I know, now know what I uh, need to do. So it's a span. So let's say, so that we have, it gives us back a, a pair while first rest equals uh, XS span. And the argument would be is the same as Y. So. We take elements as long as they're the same as our first ones, and then uh, we, put them, we put those in the first list, and the rest is what we do, uh, what is the other elements that follow. So how do we continue then with the, with the function here? Well, we would say, well, the first element is definitely first, so that's our first sublist, and it gets followed by cluster of rest. And uh, then we see cluster of data now gives us the right, the right elements here. Great. So the last one I want to do is uh, uh, run length encoding of a list. So run length encoding says uh, I want to have, instead of repeating an element several times, I want to have the, just the element and the count uh, of the list. So that we could do now very simply with what we have here. So we can write encode, and uh, here's the same thing. So what does encode return? Well, it would return a list of the element and an int, that's the count, right? And what we do is we use a cluster of XS, and then we use a map which, say, which says, uh, well, essentially that gets a sublist. Um, and what do we return? Well, we return the first element of the sublist and the length. 
Okay, so that was in code. And now finally, let's uh, just try that on our data. And we get what we wanted here. So uh, A4, B3, and so on. So you see this, uh, th this mode where you can very quickly uh, uh, explore things and write code that, uh, is, is, uh, that works and it's beautiful. And uh, I think for it to work, well, for once, the tool is nice. It's very good to have it. But for it to work, you need a concise notation. Imagine having, uh, if your every method takes five or ten lines, uh, it's not fun to write a worksheet like that. You, would, you, you, you wouldn't finish scrolling anymore. So you need the conciseness to get the, big, the high bandwidth feedback channel, which you get with that. So I think that's really, with, with, with tools like that, I think people can go much further than they could before. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Scala 2.10, uh, what we do there and how it reflects the Scala way. Uh, so first, maybe the status. Uh, so it's very close to RC1 now. Uh, we, are in, we are in code freeze now. We're working on the remaining blockers on the list of remaining blockers. Have, maybe have essentially a first version in, in a week for internal staging of community projects and, a, and a, an overall version in two weeks, but we don't promise. We don't have a time date. We have essentially a date that we said we, want, we, we will need to get uh, solve all remaining blockers, and when that's done, there will be a first release candidate. Um, a lot of the blockers are actually documentation, uh, which uh, needs to be there as well for it to be a release candidate. Um, what's also new in Scala is that uh, uh, a lot of the features were previously discussed and vetted in uh, a process which we call SIP, uh, Scala Improvement Process. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about now also, almost everything has a SIP number for Scala Improvement Documents. So here's the, the uh, uh, SIPs that we have discussed for 2.10, and I'm going to talk uh, quite of, about quite a few of them. I'm not going to talk about uh, the 14 uh, futures and promises, even though it's very important, but uh, there maybe I defer to Victor, who can tell you much more about them. Uh, he was the, one of the leads of that SIP. Futures and promises is essentially the concurrency foundation uh, that is uh, based on futures, and that uh, the, the goal was to have a single uh, foundation for that that would be used by the ACA library and the Play Web Framework and also uh, the Twitter concurrency libraries. Uh, so to have something that can be standardized uh, over everything. And uh, I, I believe we have succeeded, so every, everybody has essentially signed up for that. Okay, so I want to start with something else which is uh, pretty trivial, uh, but convenient, uh, and that's uh, string interpolation. So uh, we, we all know in, in, in Java and Scala also, to write, uh, to assemble strings is not that convenient, it's workable. So here you would have a typical string on the top hand side, you have to write a lot of pluses. And, uh, you, I, I often get it wrong that I get the spaces wrong, that I write the space, uh, I, forget, I, f I forget the space here and things like that, because it's not very visual what, what you see. So you have to often debug these things several times. So with string interpolation, it would be much shorter, of course, and what's more is you would see your string. So books written by dollar author and dollar year colon books would be much simpler to, to, to parse for you visually than the thing with the lots of pluses. Minor convenience, but still. Okay, so there's a problem with that, and uh, that's that we can't do that because the dollar character is, of course, already a legal character in Scala strings and Java strings. So we can't just interpret that like here to say that should be interpolation. It would just print the dollars normally, right? That's what the string is supposed to, to, to do, and you can't change that. So the, the solution uh, is, uh, let's look at what other languages like, let's say, Python have done uh, for special strings. Uh, well, they put an, essentially a small prefix in there. So let's put an S there for a standard string or interpolated string. And that the S in front of a string that's actually syntactically still available, it's not, uh, it's not ambiguous, we can do that. And that would then say, well, that string is interpolated. Okay, good, problem solved. 
but this is Scala, and Scala has a very strong philosophy not to do special tricks for one of convenient features, uh, for convenience features. We don't want to do that. So uh, let's see whether we can move this a little bit further and make it more extensible and more general. So the idea would be to have an arbitrary identifier in front of the quotes, and that identifier would determine how the string is parsed. So we want to generalize just from one sort of interpolation to all possible sorts of interpolation. You can write your own interpolators. Okay, so that's the idea then is instead of the S, we would let you write an arbitrary identifier. I've written ID here in front of the quotes. Uh, and the question is, well, how do we interpret that? So here's how. Uh, the rules for string interpolation say that if you write something like that, so an identifier followed by a thing in quotes, then what you get is a so-called string context, and the string context will contain all the string parts of what you write, so that would be books written by, and the in, and the colon, and the point, and then it would, sorry, it would call a method, and the method is the, the thing you name here, so the dot ID, and the method would take the interpolation thing. So it would take the author, the year, and the books, and together then the method will have to produce whatever. Uh, in this case, it would produce a string. But it doesn't need to, to, to always produce a string. Okay, so you can do that. Uh, and you can do more. So here's, here are two others that are already in Scala. Uh, so you can do formatted uh, interpolators. So the first one says increase by margin two point, uh, and then when you print margin, you say it should be printed as a decimal with uh, two, uh, two, two uh, digits before and one digit after the, de 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 the decimal points. So you can embed these percent things, and if your string interpolator is an F, which stands for formatted, it will, it will interpret these things. Or you could uh, have, can do another one which uh, reads raw here, and the raw one would uh, not do any escape interpretation in the string. Sometimes that's useful. For instance, when you want to write a regex, like in this one here, uh, you, if you wrote, wrote regex in, in Java, you know it's very annoying that you have to double every backslash, right? So because, of course, backslash is not a legal character, and it's often used in regexes, so in Java you have to double it every time. Whereas here you just say, well, I want the raw interpolator, and that would uh, actually give me, uh, do not, do don't do any backslash escapes, and so on. So these are just the simple ones that are currently in string context. But you can, do, you can add your own. One can do much, much more. So here are two others. Uh, so any user could write another string processor, uh, for instance, to replace the standard XML uh, literals that I mentioned before. And at some point, you might be able to actually remove them, which will be a great day, uh, in favor of that, if you have that. So uh, if you have these uh, uh, arbitrary string interpolators, then anybody could write an XML interpolator, and you would get a string here. And the, interp the interpolator would take that string and build an XML tree from that and verify that the, the tree is valid. And then, finally, we wouldn't have an imbalance between XML and JSON anymore because, of course, uh, you could do exactly the same thing for JSON. Uh, so it doesn't matter. Everybody can, can write the same interpolators, and you can write uh, here an interpolator that gives you some internal data structure that represents a JSON constant with in interpolated holes in it that, that, that you're going, going to fill. Okay, so that's great, um, but there's one little problem with that, and that is, well, uh, we have these, if you go back to the uh, interpretation, so every interpolator is a method call on string context. So if I want to do an XML or a JSON, then that means there must be an XML method or a JSON method in string context. How do they get there? After all, I just postulated they were user-defined, so they were not there from the start. Well, in, in, you can do that in Scala, so if you know about implicit conversions, then they come in very handy. You can write, okay, I can have a class, let's call it add JSON, and it takes a, sorry, it takes a string context, and uh, the uh, Here's my interpolator. It, uh, it's a JSON. It takes some arguments that I pass in there and gives me a JSON object. 
And that would be a class that essentially is a wrapper class for my string context. And then I have an implicit conversion that says, well, if you give me a string context, I give you a JSON object. I give you the wrapper class. And the Scala compiler knows to interpret that, that when it sees a call to JSON on a string uh, context, then it knows it will have to insert these, this implicit conversion. It will do so implicitly. OK, uh, the problem with that is it works, but it's a bit boilerplate-y. I mean, this thing is a bit uh, roundabout way to do it. So over the years, there have been many, many cries to say why Scala should add extension methods. Extension methods are exactly the right thing. Extension methods, they are, for instance, in C Sharp and a number of other languages, where you just say, well, it's essentially a sort of static method that gets treated as if it was a method in the string context. But there's a problem with extension methods, and that's why we haven't, I have refused to put them in for uh, every time the cry came up. And that's uh, that we can't abstract over extension methods. So that means an extension method can never implement any interface, and it also can't be conditional. So we might want to say, well, I, we want to add a method B for all types that already have another extension method. We can't do that. They are static. They are there or not there. You can't, you can't do any sort of higher level abstractions. Whereas with our implicit conversions, we can write uh, more interesting stuff. So we can, for instance, here I have a trait with a JSON provider and the JSON method. And then my add JSON wrapper could extend the JSON provider. And that means I get for free the implementation of that trait. So with the, with the implicit conversions, they are more cumbersome, but I can Im app implement traits. I can implement interfaces. And after all, uh, what is a method for if not for, if, for implementing a trait? So I think just having methods without implementing traits is really only half, uh, half, uh, a half solution. OK, so this is better. This is more general. But it's still boilerplate -y. So what do we do with that? Um, that comes another SIP. Uh, it was SIP 11 on implicit classes. So it's a very simple way to shorten the syntax, which we introduced. And that is to, to, to say, well, instead of having this uh, fairly complicated thing with the class and the implicit conversion, can, can't we just write implicit on the class? So like that, implicit class, a JSON. And that would implicitly define the conversion as well. So that those classes could be wrapped around objects uh, just like implicit conversions. OK, that's good. So uh, we have solved the syntax problem uh, rather simply. But there's still another problem, and that we create a wrapper, right? So a wrapper has a runtime overhead. We create a new object. And sometimes the JVM can optimize it, but not always. So whereas an extension method is a purely static method, it costs nothing. So the question is then, what about the runtime overhead? Uh, isn't that a, a disadvantage? And uh, the, uh, of course, it is, and we would like to get rid of it. So. One thing here, one observation here is, uh, you see here the Scala hierarchy of all Scala classes. Uh, so if you know Scala, then you see that here's, here's Scala any at the top. That's the root class. And then we have any ref, which is an alias for Java lang object on the JVM. And we have any val. And any val so far was the parent of all the primitive types, all the so-called value classes. And all the user-defined classes were over here, the extended object, any ref. So the question is, well, what if we drop that restriction? What would happen if classes could extend over here as well, if they could extend any one? Would that make sense? What, what would be different? Well, the idea is that, yes, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, we call classes that extend any val value classes, and there's a zip for them, zip 15. Uh, the idea there is that the elements of the value classes are usually unboxed. So that means uh, here I have a class, call it meter. It uh, is uh, essentially a physical dimension, quantity. Uh, we say it uh, meter with a certain amount, uh, so the underlying number of meters is a double. And the new thing is to say the class extends any val. If I don't write extends any val, if I don't write anything, I get extends object as usual. But so I have to be explicit when I want to have a value class. 
And the idea here is that if I write that, then the representation of meter would be just the underlying thing. It, they would be represented as, as doubles. They wouldn't cost anything. So cost, the runtime cost is zero. So here's what this would translate to. Uh, we would have, uh, a, well, let, let, let me maybe first go through the meter class. So here I have just for demonstration purposes, uh, three methods. One was the plus method that takes two meters and gives you back a meter. So the good thing about that is you can't, for instance, add a foot to a meter uh, without a conversion. So you, you have essentially built-in protection against uh, mixing up uh, different, different uh, physical dimensions or different uh, measures here. Uh, and you have also a, a multiplication which takes a factor which now is a double, a scale factor, and that gives you a, a new meter, which is amount times factor. And finally, you have a two-string method that uh, essentially returns you the amount, but with an M at the end. So, we, so, it, so it prints like 3M for three meters. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what that gets translated just by virtue of being an extension of any vowel is this one here. So you still have the uh, case class as before, but you see all the implementations have gone. So essentially they're now all forward to essentially static methods, methods of the companion object. And what the uh, methods of the companion object take is only the underlying representation. So instead of adding two meters, here I add two doubles. And well, it's just the add uh, definition of doubles. Instead of uh, take, um, multiplying a meter with a double, again, it's, it's on doubles. And two string would also take the double and just return a double and M. <coughs> okay, so essentially the meter is a, is a shell class that just forwards to static methods, uh, which uh, all end in dollar extension here. They're synthesized. You, you're not supposed to call them directly. You're, call, you're supposed to call the methods on meter, but you get the ones that you see here. So here you have some uh, client code. So here I would have I create a meter of 1.84, and then I take it, uh, multiply it by two, and here I uh, pass it to an any, uh, just to see uh, what happens there. So here's what, what it would translate to. The first thing is, I wouldn't get a meter class, it would just translate to the definition of a double. That's the first line. The second line, that was the multiplication on meter, actually translates to a static call, star extension. So star is just the internal code for the asterisk here. And what I pass is the double of M, and the two here, so. And the third one is interesting because you see the first two ones, meters didn't enter the picture at all. It, I compute on the underlying representation, but I get the type safety of the additional classes. For the first one, I have to be careful because now I pass the meter to an any. So essentially the static information gets lost in the any. I don't know anymore that it was a meter. And I still need to be able to say print it as a meter, right? So that's why in that case, and only in that case, the, uh, the class gets boxed in the end. So there's essentially the boxed representation, which we say will, will be used in the case where the static type is not known, and the unboxed representation, which is used when the type is known. So this is actually exactly the same as what Scala does anyway already for the primitive types. As long as a primitive type is known, it's represented as a primitive type, uh, Java primitive type. And if it's not known, uh, if I pass it to an any or to a generic type parameter, then I have to box it. So that's, that's what happens anyway. And by the same logic, I can treat these value classes. Okay, so there are lots of use cases. I've shown you physical dimensions. Oops. Um, ah, yeah, uh, there, there's, a, there's an animation missing here. I show you, I've shown you physical dimensions. Uh, there could be currencies. Uh, we have, I have in, in a, uh, one of my GitHub branches, there's actually very cute unsigned arithmetic. So if you want unsigned arithmetic back from C, this is it, uh, so it would be represented as just a normal Java long or int, and you get unsigned arithmetic by virtue of being a class here. Uh, bit fields, and then of course, all these implicit wrappers, which wouldn't be wrappers anymore, because they would just be static. So it they would be have what you've seen, exactly the same implementation as extension methods. 
But he could say, okay, aren't implicit conversions rather complex? Somebody told me I should stay away from them. And probably that person was right. So um, the Scala way, what we do here is to provide few constructs always of maximal generality. So that's really what we always try to do. So in this case, implicit conversions are treat clearly more general than implicit classes. Implicit classes are a special case of implicit conversions. And I've shown you that implicit classes are strictly more general than extension methods. So implicit conversions are very powerful, and that's why Scala has them. But it's true that they can be misused, in particular if there are too many of them. So it's sort of like... Uh, like uh, like chocolate, uh, they, so so in small used in small quantities is very good. But if you if you if you have too much of it, then you get a get a stomach ache. And certainly with implicit conversions, that's the case because you can then quickly you get a combinatorial problem of essentially possible combinations of what conversions might apply, and and it quickly becomes becomes difficult. But the problem is they are so powerful and uh, so. Tempting because, after all, it's not much code to write them that people use them quite a lot, maybe more than what's good for them. So the general, that's a general problem here, actually, and that's that Scala really is geared for orthogonality and expressiveness, and I believe in the end that is the most productive combination. So I don't want to go away from that and say, well, we, don't, we want to essentially have a language that has only less general features that are carefully tailored that people can't do anything wrong with them. But there are challenges. So some combinations of the language features might be less desirable than others, and some features can be misused and are sometimes misused. And people, men, most, most programmers really need guidance to say, well, uh, it takes experience to know what can be used, what, where the possible misuses are, and it's very easy to fall into a trap here. So the idea that we had here is to have a mechanism that uh, identifies some of the problematic features and demands that they're explicitly imported. And that's zip 18 on language imports. Uh, so let's say you say you, you have uh, written a lot of code in JavaScript and you say, well, I have a brilliant idea. JavaScript lets me automatically treat a string as an integer. Let's, let's do the same thing. And I can. I can write an implicit conversion. So I can have an, uh, a, a, a conversion foo. It takes a string and gives me back an integer. And it's implicit. And I compile it and, and I say, well, this is, I'm, I'm a clever fellow here. And uh, compiler comes back and says, there were one feature warnings, rerun with minus feature for details. So it's sort of like deprecated or unchecked what you, what, you, what, you, what, you, what you get in Java and Scala as well. So you recompile with minus feature, and then you get a long warning which says, implicit conversion method foo should be enabled by making the implicit value language dot implicit conversion visible. This can be achieved by adding the import clause import Scala language implicit conversions or by setting a compiler option. See the Scala docs for Scala language implicit conversions for a discussion why the feature should be implicitly enabled. So we really rub your nose in it. Uh, <laughs> and if you go and look at the Scala docs, uh, then uh, uh, that's what you see, would see here, see. So there's an object called uh, language.scala, and it has um, essentially all these things that you need to import explicitly or enabled by an option. And here's the one for implicit conversions. Um, and underneath, we, we have to work on the doc. It, 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 but for some reason, it didn't format rightly. So that's one of the things we have to fix before the release. But here, <coughs> in the last paragraph, it reads, implicit conversions are known to cause many pitfalls if overused. If, and there's a tendency to overuse them because they look very powerful and their effects seem to be easy to understand. Also, in most situations, using implicit parameters leads to a better design than implicit conversions. So we admonish you to really think. If after that you say, well, yes, but implicit, an implicit conversion is just the right thing for, for my project. And sometimes that's true. The Scala libraries do contain implicit conversions. That's why we have them, and the Scala compiler does as well. But then at least you have thought about it and have made a conscious decision rather than essentially getting into this tar pit uh, without actually even being aware that you get into something that might actually be a, a bit problematic. Okay. 
So you can turn them off then. If you say, well, I know what I'm doing and I don't want these pesky warnings anymore. So what you then would do, typically you would uh, uh, put in the, at the head of your program, you were, of your class, you would write Scala language, import Scala language, uh, implicit conversions, and that would do it. So then essentially you have, to, but the, uh, the other nice thing is then you have to declare it in your code base that you're using that feature. So if uh, your group mates want to find out what other people are doing, then they can s easily grab for that and say, is somebody using implicit conversions? If yes, we have to have a talk. Okay, so what are the features controlled by SIP 18? Implicit conversions I mentioned. Then there's a new feature, which is essentially uh, turns off static typing for, uh, uh, for elements with certain types. I have a slide on that in a second, uh, what that is. It's very useful to interoperate with dynamic languages such as JavaScript, but of course, uh, for your application, you might want to enforce static typing everywhere, so that's why it's a good idea to put that under an import flag. Postfix operators is a, a thing to, which um, are quite useful for certain fluid uh, DSLs, but in general they interact badly with the semicolon inference, so it's probably not a good idea to use them. Um, dynamic dispatch on structural types. Uh, so that, that's the thing that sometimes you can actually write a structural type in Scala and that works very well, but uh, the call to the method then will have to go through reflection or in the future invoke dynamic. And therefore the call will be uh, uh, significantly slower than a normal virtual method call. And we believe you should be warned about that because you might actually get into that inadvertently. And in that case, you might wonder where your performance went. So I think it's a good idea again to demand that feature. And finally, uh, existential kind types and higher kind of types, they are um, first uh, often a sign of over abstraction. So that's one uh, crucial thing. And uh, the other is they are sort of one of these, uh, uh, both of them are essentially things where we adopted the functional dogma a little bit too readily in retrospect, uh, I have to say. So they are sort of the standard constructions in, in a lot of statically typed functional languages, existential types, higher kind of types. You find both of them in Haskell, for instance. And I think in retrospect, that was probably the best thing we could do at the time. Existential types are necessary to deal with wildcards, but I think we have now a way in future versions of Scala to deal with them in a much nicer fashion by getting a much better union fusion with the object-oriented uh, features. So uh, that of, but that might mean that uh, some of these uh, usages will be outright deprecated in the future. So that's why I, we wanted to put in early warnings to say, you use a lot of these, uh, be aware that your code base, if your code base wants to live forever, uh, maybe, maybe you, and you don't want to change it in the future, maybe you shouldn't use those, 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 those things here because we won't guarantee that they will stay around forever. And then, then there's another le level language experimental where we put all the really wild experimental stuff. And uh, there's one big uh, chapter, which uh, I have talked about, uh, I think last time I was uh, in the Bay Area, and that's macros, uh, reflection and macros. Uh, so that's something that uh, we are all very excited about because we think we can actually remove a lot of language features by something more general, namely macros. Uh, but right now it's really experimental. So we, we are not sure exactly what they will be like, and we're not sure it will be a good, good idea to essentially make them available widely to the community. We have to watch a little bit what people do with them in the end, whether it's good or bad. So that's why we say, well, essentially here they are, but they are exper experimental. Don't, don't, uh, don't um, expect that this version of macros will be around forever. Okay, so dynamic I've quickly talked about. Uh, so dynamic is the, a, a good way to interact with, um, dynamic type languages. So um, the idea would be, let's say we have, want to interoperate with JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript is a fine language, but it's not statically typed. So how would we do that? Well, in a, in a sense, in the end, where we would have some wrapper classes that encapsulate a JavaScript object, call it JS, something like that. 
But there's a problem with that, and that's we would like to use, of course, normal method dispatch. We would say want to say, if I have one of these JavaScript proxies, I want to call foo of one. But how do I know that this thing has a foo method? It's a dynamically typed language after all, so I don't. So normally I couldn't write that because the Scala compiler, when it sees a foo, it will look up and says, well, does this thing have a foo method? No, it doesn't have one, so it's a static type error. Except if uh, the class extends a marker trait called dynamic, in which case the Scala compiler will be just fine with that, and it will uh, just re uh, replace the call by a new method call, which is called apply dynamic, and it will pass the name of the method as first parameters, and then, then come the other parameters. And if you just select a field like that, it will translate it to select dynamic. So it's a, it's a nice feature. Uh, but uh, probably good under, under an import flag because you could with that, by just inheriting all your objects from dynamic, you could essentially turn Scala into an almost dynamically typed language, almost everywhere dynamically typed language. You can do that now, but maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> okay, the, the other part of what uh, I'm equally excited about is really that I, I believe we are really making progress on the tool side. So one thing we have now is uh, a compiler called Zinc, uh, which is an incremental compiler, which has uh, plugins for Maven uh, Pants, which is the Foursquare Twitter build tool. Uh, soon Gradle, I believe. I believe they're working on that. And that means that you get the ability to do incremental Scala builds with these other build tools. So previously, the problem was that you had to essentially build a, a build from scratch whenever you use that. And we all know that the Scala compiler is not the fastest. Uh, so, so that was often pain, painfully slow. So Zinc helps because it means that you can be incremental. Um, the other thing that has uh, done, uh, made great strides, I believe, is the Scala IDE for Eclipse. Uh, there's a new version which will come out right after 2.10 is out, which is called uh, 2.1 for that version. You've already seen the worksheet, so that, that is part of that, that new IDE, and it has lots of other improvements. Uh, one thing that is very useful, to, because we talked a lot about implicits, is that uh, the IDE will actually, can actually show you what implicits get inserted, so you see you get much more better control about what you see, what really goes on in your code. There's better sem semantic highlighting, refactoring, and a much better Scala debugger support. Uh, Scala debugger always worked in Eclipse, but it was sometimes weird because, uh, for instance, you would sit on a, if you, if you did a trace, you would, it would sit on the same point for multiple times and then it would go on and there was sort of all the uh, forwarding methods, the synthetic forwarding methods that got inserted that all had the same points. So these glitches are gone because now the debugger knows about what, what Scala code is much better than it did before. Okay, so my goal for the future is really to make Scala the go-to language for smart kids. That's sort of my, my main target audience here to say people who are no prejudices just want something that works and I believe we need stuff like the worksheet and we need, we need more of that because that, that's really the thing that gives you back the, the immediate feedback and fun in programming. I do something, I get it immediately, I don't need to do uh, complicated setups and uh, write a file here and write a file there and then write all tests in 100 different files and then uh, write a build script and then maybe after a couple of weeks get the first results. So that, that, that really is something that I think we should all apply. So bring out the simplicity in Scala, focus on the beautiful side, avoid the overcomplications. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I have a question about uh, extension methods. Um, having discovered them recently myself, both in Extend and, uh, and in Groovy too, and they really do uh, allow you a lot of flexibility in creating a, a, a statically typed DSL. Uh, particularly if you want to wrap an existing class hierarchy, you can you know, add it to the base class and you, you don't break the flow, your fluent DSL. So given that that's um, often touted as a strength of Scala, it seems strange to me that you, you, know, you wouldn't include such what I think is a very powerful tool. Mm. 
Well, in terms of expressiveness, Scala always had the, essentially the same or better expressiveness than extension methods, right? Because with these implicit classes, uh, you can simulate every, every last uh, usage of an extension method, you can simulate with that, and you get essentially abstraction for, uh, for free for that. Uh, so, so, and in fact, Scala plays a lot of the same tricks that you see with extension methods, but using these implicit decorators. So it would be, I think it would be useful to see um, an example of that with something more than a double or a val, but actually with you know, some existing class hierarchy, ah. third-party library. Sure. Uh, a uh, user interface library, for let example. Let me just show you some, yeah. Um, do we have Scala library here open? Yeah. So that's the Scala class that gives you uh, the full code. So I, I shown, you, shown you in the worksheet uh, that uh, we did this palindrome and, uh, and, the, and uh, I think also the run length encoding with, with strings. You might say, well, since, since when are strings collections? They aren't, right? They are just Java strings. So that's the class that turns string into a collection. Uh, so it's called wrap string. And it, uh, it takes a string and then it essentially adds all the stuff it has to do. And it's essentially it's highly abstracted out because most of the stuff is actually implemented from string-like and indexed sequence. So it gets a lot of these methods from these general template classes and it injects them into the string wrapper. And then there's a, an implicit conversion uh, that's actually in pre-def. Uh, so, I'd have to show you, well, you believe me. So there's an implicit conversion uh, that turns a string into a wrapped string. And that's why you can, uh, oh, well, just do, do we have a, uh, it's probably string-like, right? Let's see what that is. I don't even see an example now, but it'd be nice to have a place on the Yeah, okay, so, so here's, a, here's, for instance, one method that's a star method. So to go back to the worksheet, Let's just do, uh, what, that was ABC times 10. And you get ABC 10 times. So that's a, that's a method that we add to Java strings. So you just saw it in this wrapped string. So the idea is always you write a so-called decorator. It takes a string, it has an implicit conversion, it gives you a new class with all the, all the additional method. I believe that can do every single bit what an extension method can do because it's really, but, but essentially after the path that I've shown you that you say, well, if we make it syntactically convenient by implicit classes and we remove the runtime overhead by value classes, then the implementation is essentially the extension method implementation. That, that's what you get. Only you get much more because you, you get extension methods plus abstraction plus auto boxing plus inheritance. So it's a much, much more powerful package in the end. So, so just to come back, this, so what we get with this wrapped string here is, so collections have about 100, more than 100 methods that are all not present in string. So with extension methods, I would have to implement each one of them. Would be a terrible uh, amount of work. And then for arrays, you have to do the same thing because arrays, we also essentially dress up to be like collections. Uh, whereas here you can, you really use don't repeat yourself principle. You can say, well, I put these things once in a trait, and then I inherit that trait in my wrapper. And that way I can essentially, essentially it's like you can inherit extension methods from somewhere else, uh, which is of course also not possible because you have to write them out by hand. So I think in the end, it's a much more powerful and flexible way to, to deal with it. I shouldn't monopolize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, I have a question about uh, string interpolation. Let's say I have a variable called fruit, which represents the type of the fruit, whether it's an apple or an orange. And I want to output the string such that an S is appended to the type. I didn't quite get, catch that. Uh, well, let's say I have a variable called fruit. Yeah. And the value may be apple or orange. And I want to output apples or oranges. Uh, you know, the, the value with an S appended to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with, the, with what I understand with the string interpolation, I would have dollar sign fruit S. But that can be interpreted. Ah, interp yeah. Um, yeah, good point, yeah. Um, you would write something like, um, 
Um, well, let's just set this up. Well, fruit. I only do a single one, right? Uh, so, and then we say s. Um, and of course, that we can't do. Um, so that would give us an error. So, but what you can do is you can write these things in braces. So anything that, that, that you want to interpolate, you can also have co more complicated expressions around them. And that would work. So, oh, I wrote apply instead of apple. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I had a question. Um, in terms of the performance of the actual Scala compiler, uh, what s st improvements have been made in Scala 2.10, if any? For the, for the speed? For the speed of the yeah. actual compiler mission. Um, so uh, we, we, had, uh, we, we, we were looking at it uh, fairly intensively over the last months, and we got some improvements so that it's now faster than 2.9. The first two 10 versions were slower than 2.9. The, the new ones uh, seem to be faster, but it's still no speed record. So we're talking about single digit percentages or maybe at most 10% faster, something like that. Uh, so a, a really better, uh, better performance needs to be, uh, we, we need to get that in the future. It's, it's not simple at all. It's very hard uh, to, to make it faster, uh, mostly because uh, it is a rather large uh, pro. So we found out that most of the problems with the speed have to do with the fact that the Scala compiler is fairly large and that the JIT takes a long time to warm it up. So essentially, uh, we, we get like stable optimized performance only after about two minutes of compilation. So that means that if your project uh, uh, compiles less than two minutes, then probably that's uh, dominated by the time that the JIT compiler spends to actually make the, 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 the Scala compiler faster. So the, the best hope to get uh, improvements is to keep the Scala compiler resident which you can do with FSC. So FSC is known to be much, much faster for uh, the appearance is much, much faster than, uh, than, than Java C. And now with the incremental compiler Zinc uh, that can be used in Maven and in Gradle, that, that also can be arranged that it's resident and that, that, would, that helps. So, so that's so, sort of the short term gain here. Uh, we're working on other things, including making it smaller, uh, uh, trying to find more hotspots, making it more parallel in the future, these sort of things. But it's definitely very, very high up on the performance list, if not, if maybe, maybe yeah, on, on the top of the priority list for us now. So you, um, you had an example of overriding a compiler warning by importing a module for implicit conversions. Yeah. And what if you had a, in general, you wanted to get warnings for implicit conversions, but you had this one particular pair of types that you said, oh, I know what I'm doing right there. Is there a way to say, just don't, like, like write a pragma over that conversion instead so, of calling import? Uh, so the implicit conversions, um, you're warned about them when you define them, not when you use them. Uh, so when you use them, essentially, the, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't force you to write that. So it's when you define them. So, so that would mean for this one here, I want the import. Uh, yeah, sure, you can, you can, because you can have scoped imports. So you can have just in this, you just write a block and an import and then use it and then close the block and it will be, uh, it will be, uh, will be confined to that block. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I wonder about the macros. I think there was a lot of controversy, <clears throat> and uh, sorry, I kind of got a cold. I lost my voice. Uh, so, but I am wondering, you as the designer, you have the vision for the macros, so they're experimental. But I think you have some idea whether they're gonna, you know, shape the future or not. So, what's your recommendation? Let's say we're fairly cutting edge. We don't. We're not constrained by, you know, legacy code base. We're on 292 right now. We can play with macros. So what's the recommended? Cutting edge adoption path for macros. Um, hmm. Well, I, I tried in this talk to give you more of my vision generally. Uh, so, 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 um, for if you come from legacy software, uh, so you have a large installed Java code base, or so we, we don't actually have it. You so don't. We're not constrained with full scale base. Okay, we good. can do whatever. 
Yeah, then I, I think, so, so, so my guideline would be uh, keep, try to keep it simple, uh, try to make the best combination of object-oriented and functional. Um, Writing complicated types is uh, sometimes necessary, but not good in itself. It's essentially, it's, it's a cost. It's an engineering cost, like, like writing other complicated stuff. So you have to weigh that against the benefits. Uh, and sometimes being, being simple and not, uh, I think the other thing, both object-oriented and functional is sometimes, in, part, in particular when it's very enthusiastic, you tend to abstract too much. Uh, sometimes that actually makes, makes your program less understandable for your coworkers because they sort of don't, didn't follow this path from the concrete to the abstract. They just see the abstract and said, what the heck uh, is, is that? So, so, but I think these are sort of general engineering principles. For Scala itself, I would say uh, keep, keep it simple and make best use of really this fusion of objects and functions. Your example of a value class was one that mapped directly into a double. Uh, what would it be, would it be possible to use value class to do something like a complex, which is a real and imaginary pair, and if you made arrays of those, would they stay unboxed, and to what extent would you be able to do something like a scientific library uh, that's very efficient using the value class method? So, so the answer is not yet, uh, so right now you have the, the restriction that value classes can only encapsulate a single value. So, so the most you can get is 64 bits. Uh, well, you could, uh, with, with, with some tricks, you could maybe pack two floats into a 64-bit long and then do bit fiddling. That would work. Uh, but uh, definitely for complex over doubles, uh, it wouldn't work anymore. Uh, we are um, currently looking at how to lift this restriction. We, that would require something new because then essentially the boxing, unboxing would be into several entities. So if you, if you, a value class then would be two values that you have to pass around like when you talk about complex rather than one. And that's uh, something that is com completely new from an from a engineering standpoint in the compiler. We haven't really uh, done anything. So, so, so far the value classes themselves uh, were in a sense uh, feasible because we, they are in a sense quite similar to what we did with primitive types boxing, unboxing anyway. So that would be something new, but I definitely see the, the appeal of that because of course that uh, you could do a lot of interesting things, not just with complex. Uh, and and uh, so I, I believe we are going, we're going to work on that, but no, no estimated time of arrival yet, so. Hi, uh, you spoke abstractly a little bit about the concurrent uh, programming. Uh, what's your team's overall vision of uh, where we're going with this with Scala? And uh, I also, uh, also have another question about uh, communication between processes. And that's basically, uh, a lot of that is thought of in terms of sockets and very primitive uh, streams. And in the future, we hope for something more interesting. I don't know if you can address either okay. of those questions. I guess I could, should, should call Victor and Roland up to the stage here. Uh, so so the, the, the broad design here is really what's, what's in ACA. So I think ACA is a very, very uh, complete and well thought out solution for that. Uh, uh, essentially, it builds on futures as the basic foundation, and then ACA, uh, sorry, ac actors as a, as a higher level abstraction on top of that. And I, I think that's for right now for, for concurrency, I, I believe that's what we want to do. Yeah, definitely. Uh, maybe one, one other note I think one thing that would be very or we're working on and that essentially, essentially to make it more universal. So it would be really good to have actor abstractions and message passing abstractions also in compass sockets and, and low level things that we can lift these things really well up to the, to the actor world. So that's, that's another direction of work. Uh, can you contrast your philosophy with uh, that of the uh, renegade factionalists from the Scala Z camp? Ah. Yeah, uh, so 
uh, Scala C is uh, essentially a, a library that has some very interesting ideas and concepts in it. And it uh, all came essentially from most of these ideas. So I think all of, almost all of these ideas have been pioneered in Haskell before. Now, Haskell is a very, very nice language. When I said Scala is not like Haskell and shouldn't be like Haskell, I don't mean at all that Haskell, I don't like Haskell. Haskell is a great language. I completely admire Haskell and the Haskell creators, but it's not what Scala is. The different languages have different niches, and Scala Z is essentially a way to transplant some of these Haskell ideas, which are very much about essentially applying category theory to, to, to computing into the Scala world. And it works uh, not as well as in Haskell. Uh, I think the Haskell solutions are much more elegant because they can profit from essentially type inference that's geared more, to, more towards these problems in Haskell, better support for higher kind of types and so on. So I think that for the usage, uh, there's some ideas in Scala Z which are uh, uh, very, very useful. Validation comes to mind, for instance. Uh, and there are others where you have to decide yourself whether you want that. So it's definitely one example of being very, very abstract. So you really need to have a team that is completely, uh, uh, that completely agrees that everybody is comfortable with this kind of code. It's typically the code that if you bring newcomers, in particular from Java in, that's the code that they would find very hard to deal with initially. So you have to know what you want. Well, if that's an issue for you, then probably stay away from it. If that's not an issue from you, be, for you because you're, you're, all your programmers are very much up to speed and like that, then by all means use that. It's just uh, that, yeah, so it, it, I think the choice is, choice is there here. Node? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, essentially the approach to, to asynchronous programming is, 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 is fairly similar. I mean, Node, Node of course, is uh, underneath single-threaded, so it's cooperative multitasking, whereas uh, ACA is, is uh, uh, preemptive. Uh, but uh, I believe the, the general idea to have essentially the, the idea of asynchronous behavior uh, would work very well. So I think, I think it would make, definitely make, make sense to do bridges between Node and Akka. Are we good? Okay, well, thanks everyone.